On Two Wheels this week, Jeff takes a ride on Aprilia's RSV Melia R. Sarah D travels to Derbyshire to meet the bikers. Wayne and I go behind the scenes at a bike dealer's. Gary Thompson continues the rebuild of his Honda Blackbird and Richard Hammond begins his Scottish tour. You know it's nearly two years to the day since I last tested an Aprilia RSV and now we've got this one, the Mealy R. What does the R stand for? Well, let's find out. The first thing is it feels very, very familiar. It's a big bike, but it's easy to get on with. It's like a big, friendly bear of a bike. They've made 200 modifications to the Mealy range based on a couple of seasons of World Superbikes experience, but I'm pleased to say it's still retained its excellent road manners. Well, I suppose the R could stand for ragged, because if you look at this tyre, see this ragged edge on here? This one's been used on a track day. Honest officer, not by me. But anyway, under there, you've got these Oz wheels. Now, you might not have come across these before, but they're R's, O's, Z, depending on what you call them, or even the Americans would say O-Z, but that's what it says down there. The big difference is they're forged aluminium as against normal cast alloy wheels, and so it makes them extremely light, which um, aids the suspension travel and quickens up the steering, less gyroscopic effect. You've also got, and you can't miss this, World Superbike spec, or very nearly, Olin suspension, titanium nitride finish on there, giving that nice gold finish. Brembo gold line calipers, 320mm floating discs, all the trick bits that you'd expect on a top sports bike. And, of course, the obligatory bit of carbon fibre. Carbon fibre mudguard there. Coming up the fairing a little bit, you've also got these. These aren't just on the R, they're also on the new Mealy as well. These little air deflectors, scoops there. But on this one, of course, they've got to be carbon fibre. There it is again. More carbon fibre down here on the side of the fairing, on these air scoops. There's the fans there coming off the back of the radiator. Uh, carbon fibre. Coming up to the tank here, if you can hear that, see that very dead sound? This is in fact resin. The previous tank was in nylon, but they've changed it to resin. It's made it stronger, they've made it slightly bigger, and the important thing is it's lighter too. And how do you like this nice matte finish to the whole thing? I think it looks pretty classy. Under there, and what you can't see, is a pretty 60 degree V-twin. Fuel injected, of course, but a bit more on that later. What they've also done, they've raised the engine just five millimetres. You wouldn't think that'd make much difference, but it does. They've just lifted it up a touch and they've altered the swing arm pivot. This is all part of the World Superbike experience and the whole lot is all aimed at improving the handling. Now, are these changes noticeable? Yes, they are, but they're subtle. A sure sign that the melee was pretty good straight out the box. The 998R engine power is up thanks to revised cams and induction ports and the 120 brake horse being delivered in a torquey V-twin fashion is just as you'd expect. This, of course, is a pretty 60-degree V-twin as against Ducatis, Hondas and Suzuki's 90-degree layouts. But with balance shafts front and rear, it makes for a very smooth motor. The suspension is probably over-engineered for road use, but who cares? It looks the business and works beautifully. Troy Corsa, beware. So what else is new? Well, sitting up here, in fact, it, this looks very, very familiar. They've added a new piece of carbon fibre, like a little shelf above that standard uh, instrument pod, which is the same as on the ordinary um, Aprilia, if you can call an RSV ordinary. Switch it on, it really is very clever. It's got the old self-calibration thing in the middle. But over on the left side, you've got the speedometer, and then with all these buttons down here, you can do all sorts of wondrous things. It'll actually, if you press that one, record your maximum speed. Next one gives you an, an average speed when it comes down, there it is. This one here is a reset. Next one does a little calibration check. And the one on the right here changes all your displays on the right hand side. So not only have you got the time, you've got the battery voltage. This goes back to the time when you want to change the time. And at the top there, you've got the temperature and you can actually change that from centigrade to Fahrenheit. So pretty good altogether. So you can change the, the whole lot, all those settings, whatever you want to do with it. You can see from the top of the forks here, they're fully adjustable for preload and rebound damping. Down at the bottom, you've got your compression damping, of course, but it looks very pretty with this blue anodized finish. The seat height, by the way, where I'm perched at the moment, the seat's actually 825 mil high, which is pretty high. You've got to be fairly long-legged if you want to touch the ground on this one. Coming around here, you can see the Olin's rear suspension tucked up under there. Again, fully adjustable for preload, compression, rebound damping, more anodized aluminium trick bits and pieces. You've got the standard, almost trademark Aprilia swinging arm, the banana-shaped swinging arm here. Massive construction, very, very rigid and doing the job. 
and you've also got on this one Aprilia's optional race exhaust system. It actually says on it for race use only, which uh, I hadn't really noticed before. Perhaps I shouldn't have been riding it today, but there we go. What else have we got up here? No pillion footrests. I wonder why that is. Super sports bike, you see. No pillion perch either. That is removable, but under there is just a little space for your waterproofs and a toolkit. So no pillion passengers on this one. Coming down the bottom there, you've got these beautiful Oz wheels again, but that really sort of finishes it off as the business bike. Now getting back on the bike, it actually feels very light. It's 189 kilos, which is somewhat lighter than a Duke, which is around 200 kilos. So 10 out of 10 for them on that. But looking at it, it's far wider. See the bars, they feel a lot wider, and so does the tank. So it all feels bulky, but it's not really bulky once you're on the road. Down there also, when you're waddling the bars here, you can feel there's very little resistance. It's got an Olin's damper, steering damper, top right down there. But to be quite honest, on the road, I don't reckon you need it. In fact, handling and road holding wise, it's a confidence inspiring bike that belies its size. It behaves so well, it really does feel light and nimble. It seems to carry hardly any inertia into corners and the steering so neutral and the suspension so forgiving that riding it is a dream. So that R business, what does it stand for? I'll give you a clue, Aprilia Racing. R always means racing, doesn't it? But I'll tell you what, with all these trick bits that absolutely litter this bike, I reckon they are right on the money. There's another R for you. And talking about money, how much does this one cost? 10,750 on the road. Now that's 2,000 pounds more than an ordinary Prilla, but look what you get. You get, I reckon, three grand's worth of Olin suspension, 1,500 quid's worth of Oz wheels. So I reckon that's a bit of a bargain. There's that R again. It's time to unlock the mysteries of a popular biker meeting place. And today we hold the key to Matlock in Derbyshire. Now, when it comes to the number of bikers in attendance, today we've reached our peak, but we are in the Peak District after all. So let's go and meet the outdoor types that have braved the hilly highways to get here. Well, you found a nice quiet spot. What's brought you here? Just have a run out every now and again. It's uh, about an hour's run from Doncaster where we live. It's see all the bikes. <laughs> different sorts and everything. It's good, it's a good day out. Just come from Colville. Colville, how, how far is that from here? It's about 30, 30 miles or so, yeah, yeah. 30 odd miles. Was so. it a good ride? Um, it was all right, yes. Yeah, we tried to keep off the, because uh, there's a couple of roads closed, so we've, we got a bit lost. Oh dear. <laughs> but uh, we got eventually. <laughs> so it's just in time for lunch, you're going to try? Yes, we're absolutely starving. <laughs> Oh, I've seen lots of people around here eating chips. So yes, yeah. yeah. That's obviously that, that's the fair, isn't it? Yeah, that's what you come for. And is this your coffee shop? Then? It is, yeah. So yeah. you've been part, working, part yeah, working at the coffee shop. Yeah. And it's obviously yeah. very busy. It's my Sundays. main chef. My, my main chef. Yeah. I do. Well, waiter. <laughs> Young entrepreneur. That's what they call me. <laughs> well, you've got a very busy Sunday ahead of you, haven't we you? Have, yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. Pleased about that, though, aren't you? We are, yeah. And they're all right, these bikers, aren't they? They're, they're all right. right. They're our best customers. Yeah. 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 Some people think they're horrible people and they're really... As it says, bikers welcome. No, we don't live far away, so we come down two or three times a week. Yeah. It's a good ride, isn't it? Mm, lovely. It's Sometimes. A good... <laughs> <laughs> it's a good day today, though. It's on yeah, beautiful, yeah. So you're, you're all dressed up for, um, looks like a racing bike, it's got to be, isn't no, it? No, no, that's no, 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 sit them and beg like, yeah, that's, <laughs> is it? no, yeah, it is, yeah, yeah it's a racer, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah, I'm right, yeah. what we call a Klingon, you see, you <laughs> can either be a BMW rider or a Klingon or you can be a retro man, you see, or a Triumph bike, and that's one, ah. so you fit into a niche market, isn't it, a niche market, <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder where I'm retro, probably, oh, yeah, what, yeah. Arlie Davidson sit up? Yeah, well, it's custom style, yeah, that's yeah. it, yeah, you're a retro one, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right, <laughs> I hate to admit this. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we could be on that, right? So we call them like, you know, chuggers, you see, like, chug, 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 chug. That's the Ola Davison people, you see. And what's your bike then? Uh, GSXR 1000. Oh, nice, so, very nice, yeah. So, uh, yes. Cranky. And are you a pillion rider? Have you got your own bike? No, I ride pillion. No, no. So does he always drag you along to these meets then? I don't have to don't drag, drag him. <laughs> <laughs> you drag him. 
I can't get out without it. <laughs> and there'll be more from Sarah and the bikers in Derbyshire later in the show. Hello, my name's Jeff Thompson. I'm from the Manchester Rosper Advanced Motorcycle Group, and I'm here to give you today's advanced riding tip. What we're going to talk about today is using the limit point to assess how fast you can go around a corner. Right, well, what is the limit point? The limit point is the furthest distance you can see on a bit of the road. Normally, it's where the left and right hand verges seem to come together. Now, to ride safely, especially on country roads like these, you need to be able to stop in a distance you can see to be clear. That's between you and the limit point. So by looking at the limit point and deciding whether or not you can stop, you assess your corner entry speed. If the limit point appears to move towards you, you're going too fast, you need to slow down. If the limit point is going away from you uh, and you still assess that you can stop in the distance you see to be clear, you can accelerate. If the limit point stays static at your stopping distance, you've got the right speed for the corner. And that's what you should use to set your speed. Okay, we can help ourselves with the limit point by positioning our motorcycle on the approach to a bend. If we take up the classic learner position on the approach to this bend, we'd be about two or three feet away from the, uh, the grass verge. And the furthest we can see down the road is as far as that gate there on the right. However, if we position our motorcycle out to the centre of the road on the white line, we can see another 15 or 20 yards down the road, which is, in effect, a greater stopping distance and that enables us to go into the corner that much faster, yet still safely. Welcome to Behind the Scenes. And this week we're going behind the scenes at a motorcycle dealers. This is Hunt's Motorcycles in Manchester, a big Honda dealer. And we're going to show you what goes on in the day-to-day -day running of a place like this. And Wayne is inside with John Brown. He is the boss. So, John, seeing as you're the boss then, is there, you know, like, any chance of a job? Oh, I think I need a man with a bit more ability than you, Wayne. Right, well, well, well any that's the end of that interview then, isn't it? <laughs> Flipping it. Right, well, I'll stick to the job that I'm supposed to be doing, and that is uh, sort of interviewing you and asking you a few questions about being the principal at a big bike shop. Now, the, the job, your business here has been established 50 years, and I know you haven't quite reached 50 yet. Not yet. So where did you come into the equation? Yeah, came into it at 16 as an apprentice mechanic, went to work in the workshop, and then my mother owned it. She'd owned it for about three years. She died when I was 17, and I took the business on from then. It's big time on your shoulders at 17. Yeah, it's a big thing to take on board at that age, but I think it's been good for the future because obviously I've come into it early. Now I've got to 34, I know exactly everything about the motorcycle world, the trade, and how to run a big, big business. How have you built it up then? Is, I mean, was it at this stage, you know, I mean, it's a big place already, but I mean, uh, how, how did it start? It, initially it was at a small level and it wasn't like the business, it wasn't running exactly the way it should be doing, but I knew obviously I could run it the way I wanted to run it by looking after customers, very good personal service. And just yeah, treat there is, people I must, you're quite unique. This shop, I, I've come and visited you a few times, uh, and it is unique. Straight speaking, if someone rings you up, you tell them quick on the phone how much it is. None of this sort of we can do you a special price, sir, if you'd like to come down and, and so on. It, you just tell them straight. Do you find that is the way forward? That's the way to do it. Then the general man in the street just wants to know a price, what it's going to cost him, if you can do it or if you can't do it. And if you tell them to be straightforward and truthful with them, yeah, you can get on it and sell a lot of motorbikes. Now surely the most important people in any motorcycle dealership are the customers. They're what keep the place going. And now Mike here, as you've bought seven bikes from this particular dealership. That's yeah. correct, yeah. So you, obviously you like the service you get here, but what is it? what do you look for in a, in a dealer? What do you want when you walk through the door? Um, I want service really. Um, yeah. The main thing I'm looking for is uh, good um, mechanics, um, being well looked after by the actual dealer. A mm -hmm. uh, personal service, rather than um, going in some of these bigger stores that are just like supermarkets and um, you know picking something up and walking away with it. I think there's still room for the type of dealership that you've got here, mm -hmm. where you get a personal service. I've been in these um, bigger places where they're just moving units, and quite often you can struggle to find out how much something costs. Ah, this is more like it. This is my favourite stuff, the general clothing and accessories and bits and pieces. Of course, every good motorcycle shop needs a clothing and accessory department, doesn't it? Because everybody needs a bit of kit. And of course, with that kit, you need some spares, all the things you need for your general servicing and so on. 
the departments exist. And of course you need experts to run that department as well. And they do exactly that here. They've got Simon and they've got Dave and they run the clothing and accessory department upstairs here in this building. And in fact, I believe Simon's over here. He's hard at it, sorting some spares out. How are you doing, Simon? All right, mate? Yes, yeah, thanks again. You know, this bring, brings back memories being behind the counter, I must admit. What do you find gives you the biggest buzz? What do you like doing the most? Selling. Yeah. Selling. But when somebody asks you, clothing, when somebody asks you lots of questions, tell me about a helmet, tell me about that. Yeah, well, I understand that, because I like that. What's your biggest nightmare, then? Biggest nightmare? Um, customers not coming to pick up things, they've ordered. What about when uh, when people give you the wrong information? Because that's always been a gripe in the spares department, yeah. anyway. Yeah, that's another big nightmare. Yeah. So when you say to somebody, OK, you've got a Suzuki set, what model is it? And they say, a blue one. <laughs> it doesn't help, does it? No. What, do, what do you want the customer to tell you, then? Uh, preferably the model number, like, say, Fireblade, uh, CBR 900RR. V, for example, would be a 99, uh, would be a 97 Fireblade. So it's not so much the prefix number, CBR, that you're it's, into, it's, it's that suffix last, number, yeah. it's that last number yeah. that gives you the information, yeah. doesn't it? Because yeah. I know that a big gripe is in the spares department is, is, is the customer saying it's a 99 model, but it might have been in the showroom yeah. two years previous to that, so really it's a 97 model. Yeah. Um, and you only find out when the wrong bits come, <laughs> and then you get all the earache, don't you? Yeah. Later on in the programme, we're going to bring you a little more from behind the scenes at a motorcycle shop. Meanwhile, I'm trying to prove my worth in cleaning bikes to see if I do get this job. Fun size. Now, there's something I've never understood. Tell me this. A fun size chocolate bar is not this big. It's six feet long and weighs 15 stone. That is fun size. Well, this is the Yamaha FZX 750 Phaser, and it's seen by many as the fun size VMAX. <laughs> of course, the real VMAX is a 1200cc fire breathing monster of a bike. In a straight line, it allowed to accelerate anything this side of the space shuttle. Unfortunately, it's about as adept at going around corners as a double wardrobe. So don't. This, though, is the baby version, 750cc in an engine taken directly from the straight FZ750. Pulling away, it feels every inch the mini hot rod. Your hands are quite close together on narrow bars. You sit bolt upright, though your legs are quite tucked up. It doesn't feel big, certainly, and that's because it isn't. But there's quite a pleasant surprise around the corner for you. It is not unmanageable. Actually, despite the show-stopping, rather cruiser, drag bike looks, it's not a bad shopping bike. It's really handy around town. Don't tell your mates, though. Enough work was done on that engine over the years to make sure that it'll always be there for you, and it actually packs quite a surprisingly useful mid-range punch. There's certainly power available more or less wherever you are in the rev range, which makes it very handy for town use again. Look, I know it's not exactly prehistoric, but you have got to bear in mind that this does hark back to an earlier era of biking. It's over a decade old, obviously. So at the front end, yes, we've got twin discs. Ooh. But each one has only got a single pot caliper on, so stopping isn't exactly incredible. The long, long forks are the old-fashioned way up. And then the mirrors. They hark back to an era when the mirrors were really there just to make sure you've got your helmet the right way on and make you feel rather self-conscious as you're riding along. OK, so forget the whole fun-size VMAX thing. It might look like one, but that's about it. What it's actually got more in common with is today's phaser, because despite the rather aggressive looks, it's actually a really practical but quite powerful town bike. If you're looking for something for scratching around on, you don't want to have anything with your backside in the air and your head on the floor on a sports bike, but you don't want a boring old commuter bike, and you've got about two grandish to spend, then it's well worth a look, because for that money you could get a nearly mint one, and nobody else will have one. At last I found somebody eating the chips from here, right? <laughs> Can I have a chip? Yeah, push go. Oh, look, 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 brilliant. They're, they're getting a bit cold now, but... Oh, well. <laughs> chip bodies are always cold as well, aren't they? Oh, very nice. Do you come here for lunch often? <laughs> um, not too often, a few times every summer. We always nip down here. So Don't how many times this summer have you come to some Atlas? First time this year, actually. We haven't been about much, have we? No, you've got on quite, you're having a really good chat, <laughs> isn't it? I know, we were taking the mickey out of you over the other side of the road, so we've had to pack that in now, haven't we? <laughs> oh no, what were you saying about me? Come on. No, we've just been nosy wondering who you were. Oh really? I have been <laughs> told to... furiously waving at you going, Give me your telly, give me your telly! <laughs> <laughs> I have been told to put this, this top into a hotter wash. <laughs> Next right, time, yeah, yeah shrink it Shrink it down, more, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. <yeah. laughs> so, do you ride your own bike here? 
Yeah. And are you t yeah. Do you bring anyone pillion or? Yeah. Okay. Curse comes on the back of it. Bless her. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that dangerous? No, no, no. I'm a very safe rider. I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. In fact, all the bikers that come to meet are very safe riders, aren't they? You have to be down here now because you're obviously coming down the A6 so as the uh, look out for the helicopter signs everywhere. I know. Makes I thought... you paranoid to ride along doing that all the time. <laughs> This is helicopter speed enforcement, and I thought, well, what helicopters are going to be speeding down this road? <laughs> <laughs> I found a lady of Harley's. Look, look, look. Can you turn around? We just have the back of the, the Sherwood chapter. Ladies of Harley. Now, a rare breed. A rare breed. <laughs> They've arrived on this gorgeous bike. What's your name? Carol. Carol. This is a brilliant bike. It's gorgeous. Thank you. How have you been a long way on this bike? I bet you've been touring and all sorts of things. We go with the Sherwood chapter in Nottingham. We do the toy run at Christmas for the children right. and the Easter run at Easter with the Easter eggs for them as well. We go to the County Hall in Nottingham. And then we do, we've, last uh, weekend we went to uh, Tavistock mm -hmm. and then on to Skegness with a the run there as well. Excellent. So when's the toy run for the Christmas thing? Um, it's the beginning of December. Right. It's usually the first Sunday in December. And how, what actually happens when you go on these runs? Do you go and uh, pick up toys from various places? We or? take our own toys, yeah. we donate them ourselves, and we all meet up at the forest in Nottingham and they go through the city centre on over Trent Bridge to County Hall. Thousands and then we all meet harness. there, there yes. is. All bikes, not just harness. Oh, really? All bikes. Oh, that's interesting. Mm. So anyone can join in if yes. they want to. Oh, yes. Is this the camera shy person? Yeah, he's a. Hi. Oh, well, there you go. You can show it off on the telly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you your ride, Tony. The best. GSXO. Oh, very yeah, nice. Fine. Uh, that's why I've got all this. I've just traded my TLR in for a GSXO 1000, so I'm uh, enjoying it today. Absolutely. Looking the part, feeling the yeah. part. I feel like I'm going to a wedding, you know. <laughs> the, wife, the wife dressed me this morning. Did she? Yeah, she picked it all, yeah. <laughs> Up and down. Upstairs, you know, at the, at the showrooms, taking yeah. it, see so it and match the bike and everything, and then the shoes had to match. So, uh, we're really into this matching idea as well. Oh, I'm afraid, I'm afraid so, yeah. And we'll be returning to Derbyshire for a final time later in the show. Oh, welcome back, eh? Caught me again, haven't we? I've cleaned 50 bikes since you've been gone, eh? While I'm cleaning the bikes, Paul's over in the workshop chatting to the lads. Now, some would say that this is where the real work goes on. This is the workshop. Two full-time mechanics in here, Mike and Neil. This is Mike, on a, working on a VFR here. Yep. Ma what's, uh, what's going on here, Mike? What are you doing? Uh, it's got a problem with its fuel injection. Right. Uh, so, basically, just going to check right through the wiring loom. Right. See if we can find anything. So, you have all fancy tools and things to do that, do you? What? Oh, you do, yeah. So this is this is what this has come in with with a a complaint, if you like, you know, or, yep. or a problem. Uh, but you do servicing as well. Yep. And repairs. Yep. And of course you've got PDIs and all your new stuff as well. Yeah. Yeah. So where's the bulk of your work then? Bulk. Well, what we're doing, we're doing nearly 300 new bikes every year, so there's a fair bit. 300 bikes a year. Fair yep. bit of PDI. In. 300 PDIs a year, yep. plus all the services. Yeah, services, second services, yeah. And all that. What would you rather do? Where's the, where's I don't know, they'll do out. You don't mind? And you do engine rebuilds and yep. repairs and all that as well, don't you? Yep, a lot. God blimey. Well, let me go over with Neil over here, because he's got a new bike over here. That's a repair. Well, not a repair, a problem, if you like, but he'll, he'll sort it the out. New ones, well, the and it, it, new. What are you doing there, then, Neil? What's this? Just getting it ready to go out today. So It's going out today, is it? Yeah, right. just come out the crate now. PDI. Yeah. So, is it easy to put them together out yeah, the crate? Yeah, a double. So do it with your eyes as shut, time though. goes by, they come more or less complete. Right. Years ago, they used to come in lots of bits, wheels yeah. out, and yeah. but these are just put screen on, mirrors on, charge the battery, put some fuel in it, yeah. and oil, and you're away. What do you hate doing? When you know you must get jobs, and you say, "Oh God, no, not one of them again." I hate doing that. There's no Come worst on, part to it, really. The worst, the worst day is Saturday because it's the busiest day of the week. Because <laughs> right, everyone's it's the off day work. when most people want to book the bike in because they're off work, and then lots of people who haven't bought the bikes in turn up as well with right. punctures and tyre changes and things. So it's a bit hectic on a Saturday. There must be some funny things happening here. It's got to be hundreds some... of them. <laughs> 
someone comes in with, com with a complaint and it's something yeah. stupid or whatever. Oh, you get one. Have you got any funny stories? Lots of them. You get people they bring the bike in for an MOT and three weeks later the two-stroke oil light will come on and it's our fault because we've MOT'd it. <laughs> ah, yeah, you get all that money, All that sort it? of thing, yeah. yeah. Well, we started with the boss here at this uh, dealership, so we'll finish with the boss. Uh, John, you've been here now. Well, you've not been here. This place has been here 50 years. That's great. But you've got big plans and these are the plans for the future. What, what are you doing? We're building a brand new purpose-built showroom that's onto the front and workshop all incorporated into one building. That's where all the bikes are parked outside now. That is correct. That'll all be undercover with this big glass front and all that business on it. That's the one. So that'll save you turning up at 20 to 6 every morning to wheel all the bikes out, won't Certainly it? Certainly will do. Just turn up, press a button, shut us open, in we come. It sounds fantastic. And you've got a tea room there as well. We have, yeah. So a biker's cafe type thing. You're gonna... Yeah, been knocking yeah. out some burgers, baking sandwiches at weekends. Good stuff. You're going to have a kiddies play area in case Wayne decides to come along. We'll be hoping so. If there's enough room, yeah, we'll incorporate that into the place. Right. <laughs> I must ask you, when this is all done, when is it going to be done? When's it? When's completion? Yeah. Done by the start of 2002. Really? Yes. Oh, right, so it's not uh, not going to be that long. Are you going to have a big uh, opening ceremony, champagne, celebration? Yeah, all that? first 10 days of January, we're going to have a long weekend, open weekend, get some celebrities down, yourself included, obviously, Paul. Of, co of course, it would be, be rude, rude not, not to. to. It would be rude not to, John, wouldn't it? Well, I'll wait for the invite. Last question then. Uh, Wayne's been very busy here today. He's gone through about two and a half tubs of polish up to now. He's been the boy. He's run the paint off some of them bikes, you know. We've got right. silver tanks now, some of these bikes. Have you got a job for him yet? I think it'd be rude not to give him a job. It the key be. is the man for the job. It would be. And if he fancies he can start tomorrow morning. It's man's too. Right, well, you better answer the phone. Ah, there really can be very few things much better than relaxing with a well-earned pint at the end of a day on the bike. At the end, in fact, of the first day of a week-long tour that's going to take in some of the breathtaking scenery of the Scottish Highlands and Islands. A tour with the very promising name of Outer Limits and Beaches on the Moon. Mind you, I did get off to a nice gentle start. Yeah, I know, I could have ridden my bike from my house up to Linlithgow near Edinburgh to start the trip, but it is so easy to have your bike delivered. It will cost you a few quid to do it, but when you consider it saves you a day, well, what price do you put on your own time? Now, I know for a fact that I'm not the first person to squeeze blearily through these doors, blinking in the sunlight, on a Monday morning full of excitement about the week ahead. Because here at the Westport Hotel is where Highland Riders owner Peter regularly sends his customers to overnight and prepare for the week's activities. All I need now is my bike and we are off. We had a ferry to catch on the first morning, so we had to get on the road pretty early and all gathered at Peter's place with just enough time for a brief introduction to our party of eight. The first few miles were really just a chance to warm up and get used to the extra weight on board the bikes, so our first stop for coffee was just 65 miles down the road at the Green Welly Stop, where a warm welcome awaits all bikers, courtesy of genial hosts Eddie and Fiona Robertson. Tell us what you've done then for bikers. Well, for bikers, um, because we are ourselves, we've realised the importance of a little bit of private parking. We've got the concrete hard stand here so that uh, motorcyclists can get a bit of uh, safe parking. Uh, we put a helmet wash out during the high season for them. It's very high tech that, I like it. Yeah, it may not be high tech, but it's very functional. Bit of a commercial for the area, but what brings them here? Well, the roads particularly. They've been written up in much of the motorcycle press as God's country for bikers. Beautiful sweeping bends, low traffic, not too many cars up this way, so bikers can really crack on. And sometimes the rain stops. Something. Oh yes, <laughs> just wee showers here and there. Exactly, it's very light, barely feeling. Now if we hear a really, really, really loud noise around here, uh, odds are it's him yes, on that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's quite a thing. <laughs> oh yes, oh, it's, a, it's a big mile muncher. Yes. Harley Davidsons are designed to travel long distances. So you've got loads of bikers coming in here, do you ever get the chance to go stomping out through the hills on that yourself? Oh, every day of the week. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for providing for us so comfortably. And I'm going to take advantage of your helmet wash, I think. And then it was time to be off again in a fine drizzle, this time still heading for the ferry, but via a stop-off at a rather unique power station. We're actually at sea level. The only thing is the ground isn't, which is why we are, in fact, uh, quite a long way underground. This is a subtropical plant, but that's not what this place is for. They just grow it here because it's warm. What this place is about, of course, is generating electricity, a lot of it very quickly. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Kroken. 
Now, just before we go down into the Hollow Mountain, I'll very briefly explain to you how Kurkan operates as a power station. Now, as you can imagine, we're a hydroelectric station, but we're one with a little bit of a difference. We were never designed or built to generate electricity all day long. We're here to generate during times of peak demand, or perhaps when another power station breaks down and we stand in on their behalf. But it's the speed with which we respond to sudden surges in demand. Because we can have one of our machines generating, putting electricity on the national grid in less than 30 seconds. Our ferry was still waiting for us though, and we had to be there by three, so again, it was time to press on. With just a few miles on the clocks, we were starting to relax already and discovering one of the real benefits of going on an organised tour like this. And that is that you don't have to think. Not about anything. Not about routes, not about ferry crossings. Peter even takes care of your seasickness pills. As the sun dipped, we berthed in Loch Boysdale and unloaded the bikes to make for the Borrowdale Hotel. which is where you find me now. Relaxing, unwinding, ready for a good night's sleep and another day's riding tomorrow. And I'll see you next week. This week we're going to talk about boots. Not exactly a, a riveting and interesting subject, but there are a few things that you might like to know about. Something you don't know of, well, here we go. First of all, you place them on your feet. And when you do go into the shop, it is advisable to wear a good pair of socks. Unlike me, who is barefooted. I do like to go au naturel. A good thick squidgy pair of socks means that even an uncomfortable boot with a few sort of stitches and lumps in it will in fact feel comfy and that's what you want comfort and there are other pointers but first of all shall we go through the list of different types. We start with the big fellas up at the top which are big motocross enduro styles and you can get them with smooth soles or even lumpy soles. You'd wear them obviously on your Trans Alp um, and perhaps an off-road trail bike. Then you've got your ankle boots. Nowadays, even done with a waterproof liner. There's an improvement for the 2001 version. Then you've got, of course, uh, your regular touring boot, often with waterproof liners, and nowadays with extra protection on the ankles. You've got your sports boots. Nowadays, they're getting really, really technical. They're even having plastic mouldings, torsion control system, <gasps> ever so clever. You've got your little sort of Ladies or kiddies motocross style boot to accommodate everybody and you've got your regular cruiser style that's the ones that the custom rider might wear look like cowboy boots but are proper motorcycle boots. We've even got nowadays would you believe it a boot that looks like a leather one but is in fact rubberized plastic molding so it's 100% waterproof and cheap. As you can see, there are absolutely loads of different styles of boots, but what is important? What do you look out for when you're buying a pair? Once you've decided, obviously, the right type of boot for your bike, obviously, in the case of this, a sports bike, would suit a sports boot. In this case, it's unique because it's got what they call torsion control system. Unique in respect, that's the first and only CE approved boot, approved safety standard boot. But you still get all the other features you want. If it's got a toe slider on your sports boot that you're buying, ask them. Have they got replacement versions? Can they put another pair on at a later date when you scratch them or you throw them away? Because they're no good if you can't put replacement ones and ask them how much they are because some of them can be very expensive. If you're a, perhaps a touring bike rider or something like that on a very basic machine, you go to work every day, you want a nice simple boot. The previous boot was 150 quid. This is virtually half the price, just over 70 pounds. And it's waterproof. They do come nowadays with waterproof liners and I would like to say they were guaranteed 100%, but they're pretty good for a few hours worth of riding, uh, even when they're low cost such as them. What if you're a custom bike rider and you don't want fancy bike boots, you want something sort of multi-purpose use? A cowboy boot like that, well a regular cowboy boot would normally have a smooth sole, perhaps a leather sole. These have got a proper grippy sole, they're even resistant to um, oils and petrols and so on and so forth, so they last a long time and they can be rehealed good idea and they start around 90 pounds and upwards depending on the boot you choose. There's a few pointers that I've got to mention. If it has got a waterproof liner make sure it's of a good brand. There are hundreds of different, read the label it'll tell you whether it's waterproof and breathable. You do want them breathable. As I said at the beginning of the piece, nice pair of squidgy socks makes the boot comfortable. Check your size, 
Make sure they're the right size, nice and tight and firm around your ankle. Very, very important because that's how you gain the safety. Not just got to look good, it's got to serve a purpose. And as I said, and I always say, you only get what you pay for. Can, can your brother sing? Yeah, he's brilliant. Is he good? Oh, it's fantastic. What's his favourite song? What's his best song? Uh, oh, I don't know. I can't remember. I'm just a fan, but it's good. <laughs> yeah. well, you name one and he'll sing it. Really? Yeah, Anne Sally. Yeah, he's good at Anne Sally. Anne Sally. Anne Sally. Anne Sally. That's it. Brother can sing. Just Anne Sally. Oh, he's a singer as well. So he's we've a got singer. a whole yeah. we've got a whole orchestra here, haven't we? <laughs> Then you've got to give us a I song. cannot, I cannot. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you can. Look, look, I can help you out. Give, give, sing something that I know. That we'll sing together. <laughs> no, not today, I'm afraid. You're not going to sing? Not today. You've pulled us over. You've told us little lies. I thought lies. it was a sing song with now... microphone. And... <laughs> just, just one line of a song. No, no, because no, I never know where that's going to be shown. <laughs> you, you obviously, you drive a Harley? Yes, I do. You do? Now, yeah. I've heard you're going to America singing. Correct, yeah. And what are you doing over there? Uh, well, we're going over to Florida for a couple of weeks, then we're going to fly over to Idaho, Boise, Idaho. There's a, uh, my cousin's got a, a few old cars over there, a 1947 Studebaker, which needs restoring, so hopefully. Um, we're going to ship it back. My goodness, that's going to be a job and a half, isn't it? Not really. I've got a 1913 as it is, so... Uh, it's, uh, is that your trade, old... then? Do you restore old cars? No, or what no. What do you do for a living? Uh, I'm the joint manager and director of a transport company. Really? Yeah. So do you get uh, brought along to these meets quite often, then? Do you like uh, to listen? Usually it's me that says, how we going? Oh, really? <laughs> so you're dragging him? <laughs> oh, yeah. Can't you tell? Definitely. The thumbprint on the back of the head. <laughs> when it's going too fast, it's the, you know, ah, slow down. <laughs> so you keep so, it under a tight rein then? I, I ride it from the back, you know. Oh, I see. <laughs> You're a backseat driver. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's good fun. It's the first time I've been here. Oh, is it? Yeah, what so do you think brought of it? me up. Spot on. It's like being at seaside, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we got shops and... <laughs> restaurants and cafes or whatever. It's amazing, they're all open on a Sunday. Yeah. And the biker shops as well, which is ultimate, ultimately mm. amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's plenty of biker shops here in Matlock to choose from. So how many people do you get coming here on a Sunday? Well, roughly around here, around the Matlock Bath area, we get a couple of thousand bikes, two to three thousand people about. But it's always busy, yeah. or depending on the weather, really. Oh, absolutely, but it's obviously very good for trade, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes, yeah, very good. <laughs> We've had a great time here, and if you like chips for your lunch, looking at some great bikes, doing some shopping, meeting some fabulous people, then definitely Matlock is the place for you. We've been very lucky today. We've had lots of glorious sunshine, and we've met up with the Air Valley chapter Harley-Davidson group. So, see what's in store next week at another biker's meet, and watch out, it just might be yours. Yay! Good evening and welcome to my nightmare. Well, it's not actually been a nightmare. I've quite enjoyed myself. I've spent the last few days searching around for parts, visiting different breakers, and basically this is what we've come up with. All the parts that I need to actually complete the bike. Before we do so, what we need to do is take a look at some of the prices. And what I've done is I've done a list of new prices and a list of the second-hand prices that we've paid for them. So I'll take, for example, a new nose cone. That's £421. We've paid 100 quid for it. We haven't actually got it yet, but I've been told that's what it's going to cost me. We go on to the lower fairings, that's those two pieces there. They're 251 quid each. We paid 65 quid for one side, and we paid 35 quid for another side. The fuel tank itself, again, we paid 85 quid for that. Would have cost us brand new 377. Let's go through one or two. These mirrors and indicators, they're quite expensive. They're 230 quid a piece. We've got the pair for 100 pounds. Can't be bad. The clocks. Now, fortunately, we didn't have to buy the full clock system. All we did was we bought the inner and the outer plastic bit for 30 quid. Did a little bit of a repair on it. Built the clocks back in. So that stands us at 30 pounds. Front wheel, we got free of charge. 
that's £352 brand new. If we'd have bought it, it would have cost us 80 quid. Same with the front forks. They're £476 each. Again, we got those free of charge, but I would have been £120 had we had to buy them. Headlamp itself, 260 quid. We paid £100 for that, and we also got that little cover thrown in as well. One or two other bits and pieces. Front mudguard, £103. Cost us 25. So, if you add this lot up, we've spent £490. We've got to spend about another £100 on the fairing. What? That's about 600 quid altogether. If you add that lot up, there's over five and a half thousand pounds worth. So as you can see, 600 against five and a half grand. There's a hell of a difference. Was it worth it? Well, I think it was. That's what we're looking at. Add that to the 2,350 that we paid for the bike. It's still under three grand. I've got a thousand pounds to go. So what I've done, I've treated myself with the thousand pounds. I've bought myself a nice pair of Scorpion Titanium Oval cans. That was 600 quid. Treated myself, love it. And I've also bought myself a Fabri double bubble screen from Motrex. The other one was a bit, uh, a bit scratched, so we'll use that one instead. Right then, what we need to do now, oh, as you've probably seen, when we bought this, if you can remember, the lug was broke off the back. Well, I've plastic welded the lug, I put all the instruments back in, rebuilt it, we may as well put this on first. Let's go. Okay then, let's see if we've welded that lug on correct. That just slides in there. That goes in there. Looking good to me. Lovely. Right, we need to get that bolted up and let's get the rest of the stuff on. Well, I don't know about you lot, but I've had enough for today. It's about time I had some tea. So join us next week. We're going to take the back wheel off. We're going to get the carbon hugger in. Hopefully we're going to have the top fairing as well. We can get the nice double bubble screen in. I'll see you next week. I'm going for a drink. And on two wheels next week, Jeff rides something completely different. BMW's rather strange looking C1. Sarah D meets the bikers at Box Hill. And Wayne and I have lots of fun behind the scenes at a weekend bike show.